Hello, good morning and welcome to Newsdex. We are live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 125. Across all our social media handles, we are Joe News on TV. Coming up within the next 60 minutes, CEOs berate government's domestic debt exchange program, saying it has frustrated many private businesses. We have a conversation on that here on Newsdex. Also, it's Farmers Day. The president will later today award deserving farmers, but the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, they want government to use those resources to address critical issues confronting farmers. And later in the bulletin, we have business updates. My name is Faustina Sako. Take a seat, my guest. <music> Well, thanks for staying with us here on the Joy News Channel. Now, we'll start with the CEO's concerns. The former Stanley Bank CEO, Al Hassan Andani, has berated Ghana's recent financial trajectory, saying government's declaration of the domestic debt exchange program marked a historic and troubling moment. He says fate in government reliability was shaken two years ago when Ghana announced it could no longer fulfill its bond obligation. He spoke at the Ghana CEO presidential gala dinner. If you look at <clears throat> what has happened to the banking sector, I spent all my life in banking and it's been over 30 plus years. It's a long time. I've seen, you know, uh, face up. I've seen. So there was a when government is broke, that's much more serious. Government had never been broke until we, we declared DDP. In the banking sector, no matter how long the government owed you money, ultimately they will pay you. Now, for them to come two years ago to say we cannot pay, that was significant. For a country that capital accumulation is already very weak, and when I say capital accumulation, only in 1990, uh, when Amabe and Co were staging their coups, the highest uh, capital was $25,000. So I, if anybody had 50,000 Ghana CDs in your account, in Ghana, at the SEO of 2.5 CDs to the dollar, it was 25,000. And you were sent to the rich. So if 1979, the richest person in Ghana was $25,000, and you just projected to now, what's the richest man in Ghana? Now, again, I poor private sector capital accumulation that we come, Mr. Vice President, and say we cannot pay uh, you know, bonds that we have issued, especially to the private sector people. So that, for me, is the most shocking. And I would like to see maybe in a new government that people, I mean, we phase out the programs, phase out all those programs, push the social programs maybe two years back and give the private sector space to recover. Well, also at the event was the CEO of McDan Group, Dr. Michael Daniel Macaulay, I beg your pardon, who criticized these policies for their lack of support for local businesses, stating that they create an unfavorable environment for entrepreneurs striving to make a difference. If you want to do business in Ghana, then you have to be prepared. Being a Ghanaian to do business in Ghana, you have to be brave. Many a times it looks like we don't support our own. I have tasted it, I have slept with it, and I'm living with it. And it's quite dangerous and difficult. Um, I always try to be honest with my business. It's about time we build strong indigenous businesses. If Ghana will have and top businessmen. How much did we pick from IMF? My business can generate government $3.2 billion every year. Is government looking at me straight? If you build five of my businesses and you want to go to IMF, you can call McDan. You can call Margin. You can call the rest. 
It's happening in Nigeria, backdoor. Say, give me a billion dollar, give me a billion dollar. We inject three billion dollar into the economy. That is the straight private businesses. I've read the two manifestos of the two parties. Honestly, I don't believe in manifestos, but I believe in national agenda. If war scale towards one national agenda and have one straight policy, to say to ourselves that this is what we want the next five years to be, four years to be, ten years to be, we want to build the greatest businesses in this country. We have everything. I was listening to Trump yesterday, and he made very pronounced, straightforward statement towards the private sector. And I believe that we have to really get serious. Sorry, it's President Trump. President Trump. <laughs> Elect. <laughs> President Elect Trump. And I believe we have to be very serious in this country. We can help government. We have to help government. This is our country. We don't have any other country to run to. Well, the presidential candidate of the governing New Patriotic Party, Dr. Mahmoud Balmia, said he will upgrade Ghana through innovative solutions should he be elected president. Many of you CEOs, especially those of you who do business outside Ghana, will know that the challenges we face are common in or to our sub-regional peers and even throughout the global economy. More than ever, there is a need for continuous innovation if we are to triumph for the challenges that we face as a country. This is why I am proposing to upgrade Ghana through innovative solutions. That's not all. The fourth industrial revolution is now underway. It is changing our world. The technologies driving this transformation, such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, data analytics, cloud computing, and the Internet of Things, have disrupted entire industries. Well, let me bring in Professor John Gachi. He's Dean of UCC School of Business. He is an economist. He's been following the issues in the economy for a while now. He joins us with a little bit of perspective, some of the concerns that the CEOs have raised during the Ghana CEO presidential gala dinner. Prof, thank you for your time here on Newsdex. I recall as far back as 2022 when government announced its plan to introduce a domestic debt exchange program. Two years down the line, how effective has it been based on your analysis? Prof, you would have to unmute for me to hear you clearly. Um, we just wanted to get your thoughts about, you know, the domestic debt exchange program since government introduced it. I recall that um, the Bank of Ghana told us that they were targeting some 137 billion Ghana cities with the Esla bonds and Dachi bonds. I just wanted to get your analysis. We've been hearing from businessmen uh, complaining about the impact on businesses and how it creates a harsh business environment but based on your analysis, so far, how effective has the program been? Well, I, I don't know the context within which you are asking of the effectiveness. Mm. Effectiveness in terms of uh, uh, cleaning the debt books of uh, government. Exactly. Uh, it, ha it has done some bit of that. Mm. Uh, it has not actually uh, made government responsible in terms of uh, the ability to repay debt. The gov government is still under uh, the burden of debt. The burden of repayment of debt is not taken away from the government just because of the debt restructuring program. It largely satisfied the IMF condition uh, to support us, but it has left within the economy, households, uh, businesses, the banking sector very fragile because of the impact it has eroded profit uh, of of the financial institution 
It has actually made selective uh, the banks and the financial institutions reach uh, to the private sector. The, uh, the government of Ghana continues to be the single most recipient of financial resources from the financial sector uh, as against uh, the wish and the uh, entrepreneurial uh, expectation of the private sector. So things have not changed. Things have worsened. Pressures have been brought bare to, uh, to the private sector. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult moment for the private sector mm. as a result of the uh, debt restriction uh, uh, activity of the government. A difficult moment for the private sector, you say. How best do you then propose we fix this challenge? We know that government says it has helped to a large extent reduce its debt. But then we have a situation where public confidence and even investing has dwindled as we speak. How do we revamp that? Well, I think, first of all, you need to um, match the success that the government is uh, talking about against the ill that has resulted. Mm. The banking, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the debt researching program has pronounced the non uh, performing loan portfolio of the banking system. And the non performing loan portfolio of the banking system is a threat to the capital adequacy ratio. Uh, that is the reason why the Bank of Ghana has called for uh, a, a new capital requirement for the banking sector. Uh, the banking sector has tightened regulation as a result of the development. So the banking sector is in a very tight situation. If the, the blood that flow through uh, the veins of the private sector, of government, of individuals, that is the financial sector, is really under difficulty, then you cannot say to be supporting business growth opportunities in the country. So that is uh, something that the government should learn. Of course, the debt restructuring program has concluded. Uh, it has brought some benefit to the government books. Uh, but uh, we just have to ensure that we are able to mobilize more revenue. We just have to ensure that we are able to ensure that while we are mobilizing more revenue, uh, we are, are able to provide a congenial business friendly environment for businesses to thrive. And then we do not use the taxes and the revenue measures that we are using. Uh, to make everybody uncomfortable in the country, because that will have uh, effect on the prospect of growth, will have effect on the prospect of uh, the capacity of the private sector to expand and the capacity of the entrepreneurial space uh, to find uh, uh, opportunity to, to convert into businesses uh, to ensure that the promotion of businesses in the country, growth, and employment for our people. Mm. One of the key concerns of the MPP caucus in Parliament when the Speaker adjourned the House indefinitely was the fact that some tax waivers which they ought to have sat on and passed to enable a friendly environment for the business commun community unfortunately has been affected. Now we're looking at um, ensuring that we attract foreign investors as well as boost um, the participation of foreign investors in our economy. How best do you propose we go about it as a country? I think a blanket tax waivers and tax exemptions to the private sector, both uh, external in the form of uh, foreign direct investment and domestic, is, is actually upfront and risk to uh, the economy of Ghana. Uh, if you are going to provide uh, a tax waivers and uh, uh, tax exemptions, you must first of all have a mechanism to measure the, the prospect of the, of the companies who are going to benefit from the tax exemptions and waivers. First of all, we must see whether this tax uh, waivers is going to ensure that the company uh, provides jobs in a certain quantitative measure for the, uh, for the country. Then we also need to uh, assure ourselves that the company will engage in technology transfer.
I seem to have lost connection to Professor John Gachi, his dean at UCC School of Business. I'm hoping I can reconnect to him so that he finalizes on that point as we wrap up the com conversation. We're just looking at the key concerns that individuals, key CEOs have raised after the CEO gala last night, talking about providing a friendly environment for businesses to thrive and how the domestic debt exchange program hasn't been that effective for the business community. Well, whilst we reposition our lines to get Professor John Gachi, let's do some other stories now. The presidential candidate of the new patriotic party, Dr. Mahmoud Balmia, he has launched what he calls My Credit Score, a personalized credit reference and scoring system for Ghanaians backed by the central bank. Well, this credit scoring system will offer individual Ghanaians the opportunity to demonstrate their credit worthiness transparently, helping them access credit more easily. Well, this is already been launched, and so we just want to get a reaction on how effective this would be. Let me bring in Professor Isaac Boydi. He is Dean of Faculty of Accounting and Finance. Um, he joins us um, with more on this. Um, Professor John Gachi, I am told, is back with us. We'll just wrap up with him as well. A credit scoring system, how effective will that be in our economy? Prof, can you unmute so that I can hear you clearly? Yes. Prof. Isaac Brady. Yes, can you hear me? Loud and clear. I just wanted to get your thoughts. Government have launched a credit scoring system to enable individuals um, access credit facility with ease. I'm just wondering how effective it would be in our economy. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity and good morning to your viewers and listeners as well. And good morning to my good friend, Professor Gachi. Mm -hmm. um, this initiative has been in the, on the radio for some number of months. And yesterday, it was successfully launched mm. for our consumption. Uh, I must commend this MPP administration for this board initiative. Um, we have been told that there is an intention of upgrading Ghana through um, initiative, um, uh, such initiatives. Um, for me, anything that will um, enhance the uh, entrepreneurial skills and spirits of our young people, I will support. And any system that will help reduce uh, financial exclusion and improve financial inclusion, I will support. This is a laudable idea. And we are hoping and praying that implementation also will go as planned. What is this system all about? I don't know if you have time to consider mm -hmm. and help our listeners to understand so that we don't uh, misinform uh, the public. Mm. If, I have if, if you can do that briefly for me, I'll be most grateful. Yeah, I mean, we we have had issues in terms of our informal sector mm. over the years in terms of their ability of assessing credit to improve their facility, I mean, their, 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 their businesses. Mm. Um, today, if I walk to you in the office to request for funds, it will be difficult to give me because you don't know anything about my life, uh, how I, I live my, my life. You don't have an idea. But with this system, I mean, that's how the bank they put, they find themselves. They have funds to give out. They have funds to help support business because they don't have idea about the credit history of individuals. Uh, this system is to help have a numerical representative of representation of um, score for individual that will help you to assess credit from any financial institution, and that's going to help a lot of informal sector who need funds to drive their businesses. How then do you track this? Because, for example, if I am not a monthly income earner, I don't work in any government organization, 
I probably do not have any job and own a small business, probably by the roadside, a petty trader. How then will government track my credit scoring? Yes, uh, I think we are yet to find out from the document in terms of the implementation phases. Mm. But if you permit me to add, um, for other jurisdictions or other countries, let's start with someone who has completed university and wants to have credit score. That will help the person to assess facility. In fact, other jurisdictions, funds are placed in that student or that person's account or national service account. And when the person is able to use the funds well, they will monitor your credit history, the amount you borrow, um, your credit account or the mixed account that you have. These are the parameters in which we can use to give you the scores. Then based upon this, if you want to have a credit, you'll be judged based on the score that you have. But if you take this in the context, in Ghana context, someone who is on the streets and doesn't have an account with a bank or having any access or a relationship with any bank, um, it is going to be difficult at this stage. But with the credit call system, depending on the implementation phases, we are able to assess the riskiness of, 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 of that individual. Mm. Um, for instance, if you have someone who has um, an business idea and wants to go into banks for support because he doesn't have any relation with the bank, it's going to be difficult. But the implementation phase of the credit score system will be told or will know how individual who doesn't have an account with the bank. Remember, mm. the question I wanted to ask from the beginning mm. is Ghana ready for credit score system? That was what I should have asked from the beginning. And I will say yes, because now each and everyone will have an um, account, Momo wallet, Momo account. Maybe some of these areas are going to be the other um, means of helping to get scores. But implementation will be done. And uh, we'll, you and I will know how the phases will be, um, um, the implementation will be done. Mm. Thank you, Professor Isaac Brady. He is Dean of Faculty of Accounting and Finance at EUPS. Let me wrap up with Professor John Gachi. We're just making a point before we lost you briefly. And then you can just share with me your thoughts on the implementation of the credit scoring system. You think it will be effective in our economy? Well, I think credit scoring is based on funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we have seen uh, mm -hmm. that the banking system alone has not been able to mobilize enough funds to feed the private sector, feed government, mm -hmm. uh, and the rest. Mm -hmm. Uh, even the government is not able to mobilize funds to consistently uh, disperse to uh, students who are on student uh, loan uh, in the country. These are the things that we need to uh, demonstrate. Uh, credit score system exists one way or the other through uh, the participation in the uh, telecommunication space, those who are taking loans from Unfortunately, we seem to have lost Professor John Gachi again. But that's how we wrap up that conversation. Let's shift our attention now to other issues. Today is Farmer's Day here in Ghana, and it is a day to recognize deserving farmers and fisher folks who have distinguished themselves in their various fields. Well, the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana has raised concerns about challenges facing the country's agricultural sector and urged government to shift focus from ceremonial events to addressing critical issues. Well, there would be a ceremonial event later on where the president would award some of the top best farmers. But then let's bring in Bismarck Ousunote. He is executive director of the Peasant Farmers Association. Thank you for your time here on Newsdex. I just want to get your thoughts. Do you think we should do away with the ceremony? Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, once again, on behalf of Peasant Farmers, I want to extend our warm commendations to all farmers across the country. Mm. Uh, indeed, uh, if you look at the struggle that farmers go through, 
uh, to produce food on the table, uh, then you know that it is worth uh, commend, commending them on a day like this. Uh, if you read our statement, uh, the Peasants Farmers is not necessarily against the award of farmers who have done a lot to help the nation. In fact, we have the opinion that for farmers, it needs to be the most highly recognized group of people, considering the key role that they play in the country. Mm. Uh, the, where, where we have issues mm. are the fact that we seem to focus more on the ceremonial aspect of uh, uh, recognizing farmers, whilst we are mm. neglecting the key challenges that are confronting farmers in the country. Mm. And uh, over the years, we always highlight the perennial problems that our farmers are facing. Mm. Issues around access to infrastructure, financing. There are major issues that day in, day out, we hear government only pay lip service to them. Uh, even in this year, I think there are very critical things that uh, we feel that is high on the agenda and that if the government is really committed about the, the concerns of farmers, uh, I think we should have seen more action from them other than just doing a ceremonial event to award them. And we highlighted three main key things that are of importance to us. The first one was the issue of Galamsey. And uh, we are very clear on the devastating effect it's having on our farmers, how it is affecting their livelihoods, the pollution of our water bodies. And unfortunately, the government's action or inaction towards the of Galamsey is not a testament of their commitment to addressing farmers' concerns. So you can't be celebrating a farmer's day when a critical issue that is concerning farmers about their land, about their waters, you've not critically addressed it. That's something that we find a bit hypocritical. On the second part has to do with the dry spell that occurred in some part of the country, where we all know that farmers lost their farms because of the dry spell. And we were promised by government to get some relief packages. As I'm speaking to you now, issues about the packages are not forthcoming there is, some, there is no form of transparency in the whole process. We were told the distribution will start from the 10th of uh, October. We are in November. And as I, I can tell you in authority, that no single farmer has received any item as part of distribution uh, uh, relief efforts. So it's like the government is just being a lip service to the whole thing. And then most importantly is the government's own policy of agricultural transformation, that, that the PAB, which was launched in March this year. That particular program has become a catastrophic failure because if you look at the design of the program, the main objectives the program was supposed to achieve, the implementation has deviated. And I can tell an authority that less than 10% of farmers have actually benefited or have been included in the program. And it has become an avenue for political uh, exposed persons to manipulate the system, take fertilizers, and supply it to their own cronies. So with these problems that are faced are, 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 are on board, uh, we felt that on a day like this, the government should rather be showing commitment to ensuring that the plight of farmers have been addressed. But instead, we see that there, there is more uh, um, attention toward the ceremony and giving of speeches and making big statements when the issues come with the farmers are still there and are still troubling the farmers. Mm. You have just highlighted some of the key things you would like government to address. Um, I would like you to clarify for me with the issue of the relief items for farmers affected by dry spell. Are you saying that as we speak, no farmer in Ghana has received the relief items that the Greek minister assured was going to be distributed? Right. So, you know, with the relief items, mm. uh, at least... The scanty information we had was that they were in different categories. Okay. So the farmers were going to receive um, inputs, uh, fertilizer and seeds. Uh, others were going to receive cash transfer. That's for those who they lost their, their, their farms to the dry store. Mm -hmm. And then we were told they were also targeting LEAP beneficiaries to also benefit. So what we were saying was that the, the LIP beneficiaries... Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great. So what you were saying is that the LIP beneficiaries are beneficiaries who fall under the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection, and they are not necessarily farmers. So if you are doing an intervention for farmers, just target the farmers very well. Now, we have been getting... 
information from our members across the eight regions that we are facing. As we speak, what we have been told is that the ADIC directors are telling them to go and register because registration is still ongoing. So even though we're told that on the 10th of October, that's when dismissal was going to start. If you go to other districts, you are being told that it's not that they are doing registration. Now, even with the registration, the farmers are supposed to register on the app. After you register, you are supposed to have extension people come to your farm to map your farm to complete the effects. As I'm speaking to you, almost all the districts that we, we, we our members are, they have few extension officers who are trained to large number of, of farmers. So they are not able to go to their farms to map their farms. So there are several farmers who have registered, but they don't have their farms mapped. So currently, that's the state we are in. And the actual okay, so hold on. Of, when you speak to the director... Hold, hold on for me, because I, I want to get clarity. How many of your members have been registered? So, you know, it is based on every district. Every district has their own data. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go to... There, there are some few uh, districts that we engage our farmers on. For instance, if you go to a place like uh, Nanumbanov, some the our farmers who are there who want to register, there are just about three thousand. Those who have been actually able to register on the platform are less than thousand. The whole of Ghana. And even if they're less than thousand. A thousand no, for the district. No, I mean I'm talking district. about just one district. Okay. I'm just talking one district. So do you have a figure just... for the whole of the country, all your members? How many have been registered? Because you 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 were categorical when you said that no farmer mm. has received the relief items. So we just want to clarify yes. at what stage um, government is at as we speak. And because you are on the grounds, you are engaging the farmers. I want specific yes. figures as to how many people or members have been registered. So to get the actual data, unfortunately, we do not control the back end of the data. Okay. That data sent to the Ministry of Food and Agriculture under the platform. Mm. The last time I checked, the, that database has registered about 800,000 families. Yes. But this comprises farmers all over the country under the BFT 2.0. So it is difficult to distill a number which of them registered for the relief items, which of them for the BFT 2.0. So the information I'm giving is limited to the farmers who are supposed to be affected by the dry spell. Mm. And because the registration is not telling me, we have gathered data from our own members right, so who have been able guys, to register and who have half their house mapped. And as I was saying, if you go to a place like Mahimano, the number of our members who have registered on the platforms are less than 1,000. Now, out of this number, even less, just about 10 or 20% of them have had their farms mapped. So meaning, if you don't have your farms mapped, you are not going to benefit from this registration. And the, our interaction with our members show that it is almost the same across other districts. So there's a, currently a problem with registration by farmers across the country. Because one, their logistics in terms of the equipment are inadequate. Two, the personnel who are supposed to do the registration are inadequate. Because in instances, you have one extension officer attending to over 30,000 farmers. So how is he or she going to register all these people and go to their farms and go and map the farms? So that's the bigger thing we are, we are confronting with. Mm -hmm. So if you engage the agri directors, you are being told that the farmers should go and register. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. those are the things that the farmers are facing. So if you are not able to solve that problem, how are you able to now start the distribution process? And, and when we engage almost all the agri directors in the respective districts, they've not received the items yet for them to do that distribution. So as far as I know, we don't know of any distribution going on. What we know is that the beneficiaries who are under the LEAP program are getting some cash transfer. But because they are not in the scheme of the farmers, uh, we, we can't say that they are part of the farmers who were affected by the, flood, uh, by the, by the dry spell. Mm. Bismarck, we have just barely a month to the elections. I know that political parties have been engaged in association as a Peasant Farmers Association what key policy would you like to see introduced in the next administration that would help ease the plight of farmers? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, and it's good because uh, during the uh, uh, development of the manifestos, we had the privilege of speaking to about three or four parties who came to meet us to get our input. 
And we're very clear on the kind of issues that are affecting our farmers and what needs to be done. Mm. In the first place, I think that the, uh, there's a broken record when it comes to our agricultural infrastructure, our issues about our irrigation facilities, mechanization centers, storage facilities. I think for that one, we all agree that there's a huge gap that needs to be filled. And every part that has come to power is something that they have to address. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue of agricultural financing is so critical that we feel that the um, policies by the political parties or the mm -hmm. proposals do not seem to address that issue very well. Mm -hmm. When you talk to all of them, they talk about establishing either an SME bank or women's bank. Mm -hmm. The establishment of the bank itself is not a solution because we've put up an SME bank or a women's bank, and they are still giving loans at the rate of 30%, 20%. You've done nothing. So the issue is about how do we ensure that there is a policy of regulatory space that allows for farmers to be able to access facility at an interest rate of less than double digits. Uh -huh. right, that's the most important thing. The other point that is of critical importance to us is how we politicize the implementation of every policy in Ghana here. Since time memorial, any time any government puts in place an agricultural policy, mm. we realize that they consult us for the design of the policy and the formulation. Mm. And we all agree on a path of implementation. But when they start implementation, they deviate from what is agreed. They bring on board their people. The uh, issues of corruption, rent seeking, comes into place. So we realize that eventually, the actual family do not benefit from the policy that we feel is working well. Mm. So we are saying that instead of always looking at the political has leading the implementation, we should be able to empower the regional and agric district agric directors, mm. who are the direct implementers of programs, give them the free role to do their work. Unfortunately, politicians don't do that. So they come in place and then they hijack the whole system. And that's something that we feel that in the new government that's coming to mm. play, they should look at it very well. Okay. How do we ensure that we don't allow politicians to detect what they, because anytime time you allow mm. them, they bring in their cronies and then they mark the whole process. Okay. So this is some of the key highlights that we feel that any new part that is coming on, they should be looking at to ensure that the farmers' concerns are highly addressed. Okay. Thank you, Bismarck Owusu-Norte. He is director of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana for your time here on News 6. Well, happy Farmers' Day to you. Away from that, the environment report released by Civil Group Connecting Communities, Climate and Policies for tomorrow, 3CP, is urging political parties to come clear on manifesto policies that aim at tracking climate change. The group says manifestos of the various political parties, especially the many opposition NDC and the ruling MPP, do not indicate a clear path of commitment with less than 30 days to the general election. Here are extracts of their statement coming up on your screen shortly. It says that presidential candidates of the various political parties should engage the populace, especially farmers and fishers, on what the government will do in addressing climate change issues. Should they be given the note? Presidential aspirants and political parties must come out and state clearly their plans to help mitigate the effects of climate change being experienced in the country. Despite Erastus Asaridonko's work, illegal mining still continues. And we're still pushing the agenda here. Um, we want justice for Erastus. He was attacked alongside his camera crew and driver whilst on the ground filming um, some illegal mining sites in the country. We're still pushing for justice. And here at the Joe News Channel, we are also pushing the agenda, hashtag Defend Media Freedom. Well, let's bring in Charles Smith, his project coordinator for 3CPs. Well, we have, as you said in your statement, less than a month to the December 7 election. The question is, why are you raising this concern now? Charles, you have some mute for me to hear you clearly. Hello, can, can you hear me? Loud and clear now. I'm wondering why you're making this demand now when we have 
barely a month to the December 7 polls and manifestos of most political parties, at least the two political parties, the NDC and the MPP, they've already outdoored some of their ma manifesto. And so we're wondering why you're raising the concern now. Why not earlier? We seem to have lost connections to um, Charles Smith, yes, uh, project coordinator for 3CP. I have you back now. I'm wondering why you're doing this now. Why not earlier? Okay, thank you very much. So, um, you know, it is because of the engagement that we were having with the farmers mm -hmm. and then the fishers. And we wanted to, um, as it were, finish with those engagements. And besides, this project looks more at how we can connect the communities to climate change issues and then how they are also connected to politics. Now, in our interactions with um, farmers and fishers across uh, five regions, um, namely the Upper East, Northern Region, Western Region, Volta Region, and Ashanti Region, we realize that, yes, the political parties have stated quite a number of things in their manifestos, but these people do not know about it. And one participant at an engagement uh, in New Tafra Dimension, and his, his words were, why is it that the politicians come to us with the things that they need but not what we need. And um, again, uh, looking through the manifesto, realize that the political parties have quite a number of good things in their manifestos, but they have not mentioned them on these platforms. Mm. And I know it's surprising that for, to note. Let um, me come in at, at this point. Website. I know that for most political parties, they have a manifesto committee. And as part of their key responsibility, they are to engage various groups to help inform the kind of policy direction they choose to go with. So I'm wondering why you're raising this concern at this point when we know the two key political parties, the NDC and the NPP, have outdoored their manifesto and they already have a picture as to the key policies they would be implementing. Why now? Why not earlier? So we want it now because the issues of climate change affect everybody. And what we are calling for is for these political parties to use their platforms to talk about the issues. Just as you, you mentioned, yes, they have their key policies mm -hmm. um, that they, 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 they are all targeting at, or the key things that they are talking about. But we want them to use this same platform to mention some of the key things. For instance, if uh, you were talking about the Rastos Donko and whom we cited also in our release, this gentleman has been doing quite enormous work as far as the fight against Galamche is concerned. And you and I know that in November 2022, the Parliament of Ghana passed the EI um, um, 2462. Now, these political parties launched their manifestos August this year. Surprisingly, none of them in their manifestos even mentioned that they are going to repeal or revoke the LI. Uh, I mean, the, 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 yes, the LI 2462, uh, 64, which a lot of us have been talking about prior to their uh, release of their manifesto, that they need to um, um, repeal, the government need to repeal that particular law. So it tells you that, yes, indeed, um, yes, they have their committees, but we are calling for them to use the, the same platform that they use to talk about some of their key things, key policies that they want to um, uh, implement, be it 24-hour economy, be it digitalization, be it free SHS, in the same manner to talk about these things. Because, believe you me, if the people in the country do not have the requisite climate. And we all know the effect of climate change. I mean, if, if people in Volta region, in the central region, in the greater Accra region are suffering from high uh, tidal waves and they are being displaced, if people in our hinterland, western region, Ashanti region, upper east and upper west, the farmers there are not getting um, the right weather to work with or their farms are being uh, filled with, with, with uh, waste, plastic waste, and they are not getting the requisite um, need, uh, needed environment to work, then wh wh where will these policies land us? Where will it take us to? Because all these policies, the, the ones that are being highlighted, are just towards making sure that we, we, we have the best of livelihoods. Okay. But okay. climate change goes to the core of our, of our livelihood, and, and mm. that is what we are calling for. We want them to actually use their platforms to talk about exactly what they will be doing to make sure that we mitigate the effect of climate change on our livelihoods as, mm. as a people. Thank you, Charles Smith. He is project coordinator for 3CP. You're still watching Newsex. We'll be back with business updates. Do stay tuned in.
Welcome to Business on Newsdex. My name is Winston Taki, and now to our first business story. Quality Insurance Company has introduced its newest product, Weather Index Insurance, to protect farmers and agricultural businesses from harsh weather conditions such as drought and excess rainfall that can impact their yields and operations. Speaking at the launch, manager of Agri Insurance Unit at QIC, Sarah Bempo, assured customers of a maximum payout of 100% of some insured to affected farmers. Quality Insurance Company, in partnership with Ibiza, has developed a weather index insurance product designed to protect agricultural businesses and individual farmers from unpredictable weather conditions that significantly impact their yields and operations. Speaking at the product launch in Accra, Sarah Bempo, manager of the Agri Insurance Unit at QIC, highlighted the benefit this insurance offers farmers. The farmers have already said they don't like book long, they don't like too much paperwork. So you just fill one form and that's it. The other thing is that you don't need to wait for the end of the season to get your payouts. As long as there is a trigger and is established, you get your payouts within 10 days. So it is very um, easy, quick, and also it's very transparent because you can actually monitor your policy from your device. So the maximum payout you can get is up to 100% of your sum insured. Bempo further explained the product extensive reach and its target market. So we are looking at selling this at the meso level simply because if we try to do the micro level, it will be too expensive for us because farmers are scattered all over the place. So we are doing the meso level, trying to put them, deal with the aggregators, OBs, um, FBOs, farmers who are already in groups. That doesn't mean that we are leaving out the smallholder farmers in totality. Like if they come to us, our doors are open, we will deal with them. However, we will not actively go chasing them in individually because that will escalate the operational cost. Professor Irene Susanna Ejiri, Associate Professor at the Department of Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness at the University of Ghana, also provided insight. I believe that it allows farmers, when they have the payouts, we talked about improved seed, use drought-tolerant seed. You have to pay for that. Use fertilizers. You have to pay for that. Even build irrigation. You have to pay for that. And I believe that this payouts will incentivize farmers to do the right things. And they have bundled the service. It's not only interested in receiving and paying out, but they are going to do capacity building. So very soon, farmer behavioral change is going to follow. So the farmers will do the formal things we have been teaching them so that their yields will always be good. And in case there is a natural disaster, they also have this fund to follow. The Quality Insurance Company's Weather Index Insurance is a parametric policy in which claims are automatically triggered when specific weather conditions. The Mastercard Foundation, in partnership with Agri Impact Limited, is implementing the Harnessing Agricultural Productivity and Prosperity for the Youth Happy program to create 3,260 jobs and increase food production by 2027 to address food security among other issues. Speaking at the program's annual learning event in Sunyani, the group chief executive of Agri-Impact, Dan Akwe, explained that the program will explore opportunities in the production of rice, soya bean, tomato and poultry value chains to reduce the import in country. Precious Semavo has more. Implementation of the Harnessing Agricultural Productivity and Prosperity for Youth Happy Program, an initiative of MasterCard Foundation in partnership with nine other implementers led by Agri Impact Limited, started a year ago to explore job opportunities for the youth with 70% targeting women. The program implemented across Ghana will equip the youth with skills and tools to increase production within the rice, soya bean, tomato and poultry value chains to create 326,000 dignified and sustainable jobs by 2027 and promote value addition and marketing among others. The group chief executive of Agri-Impact, Dana Kwe, said this will reduce food importation. December 1st to 30th September 2024, 
the program has been able to open up job opportunities for 94,000 young people in Ghana in the four agricultural value chains. It is not only creating jobs, but how do we also increase food production to address food security in the country? And the aim of the program is that every year we should be able to produce 189,000 tons of food. And by doing that, we will be able to reduce our food import by $200 million a year, which is about 10% of the food that we import into the country. One year on, we have learned a lot of lessons, and we need to share the lessons that we have learned to inform other organizations in agricultural program development. He said they are working with the Ministry of Agriculture to have the youth on board. We are working with the Ministry of Agri and the district assemblies to sensitize the young people. There are a number of platforms too that we share links for them to apply. Once you apply, you go through screening, you are selected. But the communities especially, where you have structures at the community level. It could even be the assembly, it could be farmer associations, um, faith-based organizations. We are working through all of them to do sensitization, and through that, we get the young people to come on board. Head of Entrepreneurship Development at the Ghana Office of MasterCard Foundation, Godfred Odam Tensoa, expressed satisfaction with their partners so far. One of the things that has really stood out for us, which is working very, very well, is um, the private sector engagement on this program. And you would realize from the earlier session that um, there's been some core partners around poultry um, activities who have onboarded this program and are helping us ultimately reach out to the young people, especially women. And it's, it's of... We have more business update for you at midday. My name is Winston Taki. Over to you, Fosti. Thank you, Winston, for bringing us business. And that's how we wrap up the bulletin. For more news, please log on to myjohnline.com. My name is Faustina Safo. Good morning.